So hello, good morning. My name is Sibylla. I'm a performance artist and a researcher in cultural studies. And I come from Hamburg, from the Forschungstheater, the theater of research. The theater of research is a place where children, artists and academics do research together. And I was asked to talk a little bit about our approaches and our ways of working. And I will do that by telling you the story of the theater of research. So I would like to take you on a journey through space and time now. And this uh, journey starts 13 years ago when I just had finished my PhD in uh, media studies. And I, it was a PhD about time. And um, the main hypothesis I worked on in this PhD was that time actually is not a condition, a universal condition we are subjected to, but time is actually something that we create together every day by media practices, by protocols, by, um, by everyday practices actually. And so I tried to prove that in this PhD, that time is something that we produce collectively. And I had to, to prove that by, by bringing historical evidence, because that is how cultural studies work, right? So um, after I finished that, and I, I have spent a lot of time in libraries, I felt that I missed a way to now apply my knowledge, you know? Like, how can I now use what I found out about time in real life? Okay, I can bring historical evidence, but can I put this knowledge that we are actually making time, and it is not just something that happens to us, can I put it to use, can I experiment it with it? And I thought, where can I find a field uh, or, or a place in society where I, can, where I can do research about it. And I thought that maybe primary school might be a good place to do that. Um, because primary school obviously is the place where time regime really kicks in, right? So I went to, pri it, so initially I didn't meant, I didn't want to work with children, but I wanted to experiment with time. And so I did interviews with uh, children from second grade and asked them what actually changed in terms of time in this transition from kindergarten to school. And they said three things. And they were actually quite happy that someone was talking to them about it because they were wondering. And so wh what is this all about? And so they, th they said basically three things. They said, well, you have to be on time all the time. That's different. And you, there is a difference between work time and play time. N nobody knows why. And um, then, of course, it's also that you have to give the presence for the future. You have to do something now because you want something in the future, which is the strangest thing of all. So, and then we, we came up with a performative setup for schools to, um, to experiment. Could we... so? Together with the children, we said, okay, let's stop school time. Let's try to stop this, these three things. How can we do that? What do we have to take out of school to change the school time regime together? And so we got rid of the clocks and so on. But we only succeeded when we replaced time measurement itself by something else. So we had... we. It wasn't enough to get rid of the clocks. We had to create a different clock. And that was box time. We brought this box. I can play it to you again, maybe. Can I? Yeah. We brought this box um, initially to give children a chance to be alone in school and to think. And then every, everyone wanted to be in this box. And so one hour was the time all the children from one class needed to be in the box as long as they wanted. So, do you know? So, after everyone was in the box, one hour was done. So, that was our new time measurement, and that worked quite well. And so, uh, what I did was we, we documented, of course, these, this research in school. And then, a few weeks after working with a specific school, we did a stage performance where we included all this documentation, but also we used the stage and the children we did the research on were in the audience, you know, so we used the stage 
to explain to the children what was actually our interest in this whole thing and what was our thought, our thinking about it. And, and also we introduced the theater as a space where, we, where it's much easier to experiment with time than in primary school. And so um, basically we repeated that thing a lot um, of times. So um, of course, so in a way we invented um, a way of working, number one, by, by uh, developing stages of our research. So it starts off in cultural, in the beginning it started off in cultural studies, then there was a field research um, where, we did interac where we interacted with expert children in a performative setup, and then we presented the outcome back to the children who did the research to us on stage, and we repeated that. So I did this school time regime thing in about 10 schools in Hamburg and had about 10 performances of it. And after that, I reported back to cultural studies and I wrote like scholarly essays about it. So that was the beginning. But um, what was maybe more important about it was that unintentionally we did something that many people wanted in those days 13 years ago we bridged the gap between cultural education and professional stage work which is something i mean you all, might all know this gap that there's a big difference between if you are a professional artist or if you are an art educator but somehow this difference doesn't really make sense at least not to me so um we bridged this gap by this method of participatory research. And uh, that was what brought funding really to, to, to the whole endeavor. But what was more important about it for me was that there was a kind of revelation um, after I spent so much time in academia, I finally understood that research is not something that is a privilege of people in academia, but everybody does it, everybody does research and children do it all the time. And it's not my, I, as an artist and as, an, as a researcher from academia, it's not my responsibility to do research about other people, but my responsibility is to organize the research of every, everybody's research, you know? Organize it, make it visible, make it acknowledged. Um, so that is what I wanted to do then. And I found that children are actually very good accomplices for what I wanted to do in terms of cultural research. As a cultural researcher, you have to find things strange which are evident for everybody else, you know? Time regime is something very normal for everybody, but still you have to find it strange to start doing research about it. And children are perfect accomplices for that because for them it's also, many things are quite strange, right? So, um, I went on doing that. In, in the course of this project, this very first one, I asked children um, to send messages to the future. And many of the children, thinking about the future, um, told me about being astronauts. They imagined themselves to be astronauts in the future one day. And of course, I, it made me kind of sad because, you know, from Germany, I think two people made it into space. So <laughs> it was quite improbable for them to become astronauts. But then I thought maybe we can do something about it. You know, I would actually like to be an astronaut myself. So uh, I, I connected this wish of the children to a discourse that was going on in cultural studies in those days that was about the planetary, which is also connected to the en environmental issues, of course. How can we be not global citizens, but planet citizens of the planet? And so this was also referring back to Buckminster Fuller's notion of the Earth as a spaceship. And so we came up with this um, space station that was, is very much like the International Space Station in space, but it could be built in a schoolyard. And in this space station, we trained to be astronauts without leaving the Earth. So how can we actually kind of change our notion of the everyday into a per perceiving that we are actually moving with this spaceship Earth through space. So how can we make this shift of mind, right? So we tra trained that. And then um, people who did this training could uh, decide to become members of our club of autonomous astronauts if they liked. And then they were invited to um, 
to unions of this club in the theater where we presented our experiences as autonomous astronauts to each other. Children were presenting and also professional artists and researchers were presenting their research about um, the spaceship Earth and what we do in it. And so um, this project was very important for us because it kind of made us aware of a technique to uh, create projects which, is, which we still use today. And um, it's the, I would like to call it the triangle of performative research. And it's made out of three entering points which are really important to find if you st want to start a project like this. So up there is the wish. So that is the most important thing. So this whole pro the, all these projects are driven by this wish energy. I want to stop school time might be some, a wish like that. I want to be an astronaut is maybe even a stronger wish like that. And then, but then you have to connect this wish to, um, to some discourse, so to a question that comes from cultural studies or from, from some field of knowledge. And also, of course, you have to, which in this case would be the, plan the discourse about the planetary and the spaceship Earth. And then, of course, you also need an idea how to make this real, how to make this something that you actually can experience, which is, in this case, the space station. This is the setup, the art point of entering it. So, <coughs> sorry, basically, this is knowledge, this is art practice, and this is the entering spot of the children, basically, into the process. And if you manage to get the... I mean, there are many, many projects I would love to do, but I still can't find one of them, right? So um, you, for us, it's really important to have all the three thing, all the three points, starting points, because only then, in the middle, you have something that we call the improbability um, field. So in the improbability fields, it's a little bit maybe what Darren called micro-utopias, referring back to relational aesthetics. In the middle of it, there is something like a reality, at, um, a, a reality that you rehearse, a reality um, uh, to be tested in a way. Um, and we try to make it as real as possible, this, this reality. And, um, also, um, the wish and the real are, of course, in attention here. So children want to be astronauts. Okay, we give them this space station. But then we ask them, do you feel a little bit more like an astronaut now? And they go, no. I mean, astronauts can fly, you know? If it's very nice, this whole thing. I understood that I'm on spaceship Earth right now. But, you know, as long as I can't fly, I really I, I don't care. So... <laughs> So, uh, but you need this, this kind of frustration, you know, this moment of, okay, we didn't do it, because, <laughs> because that's research then, and you can, you can go on and design something that is actually exactly about that. So, how can we actually feel like flying, you know? So, it's, this, is, uh, this is an audio guide uh, um, kind of training that is called flying while lying. So basically it's, it leads you th through something that you understand, that you kind of see where are we going, how is the sun moving, or how are we moving then, and so you are kind of led through a perception that in the end you really can feel, ideally, that you are flying. And um, yeah, so this frustration, this tension of the wish and the real is very important. And uh, back to the back to the uh, triangle, of course, projects are quite different in terms of where they start. So, for example, a project that would be m very much about the wish that started with the, with, with the wish is the project Real and Other Pirates, because I don't know how, it, how it's here in Sweden, but in Hamburg, you know, to be a pirate is something really, really important. So there's no children's birthday party without a treasure hunt, really not. And, and, and off it's even on the toothpaste, it's pirate toothpaste, you know. So um, basically children were very, very surprised when suddenly real pirates showed up because Somalian pirates were brought to Hamburg to trial. <laughs> and children were like, what the fuck, you know, how, how, it, how did they get out of the movies and out of the book, and more importantly, why does nobody like them anymore? 
right? I mean, we are told they are the greatest guys, and now, what, what? What is going on? And actually, we had the feeling that they dared to ask questions which were so much better than the journalists asked, <laughs> and, and which were actually the questions we all had, kind of, but wouldn't dare to ask. So, so we collected questions children would like to ask a real pirate, and video documented them, and they were in the pirates in their favorite pirate's dress or something, asking these questions. And we kind of um, had in the end, I mean, we did it with 200 children or more, but in the end we had like 60, 60 questions, which was still a lot. And we then a long process started where we tried to find real pirates who could answer the questions, because in the, in the beginning we were kind of naive. We thought we can go to the prison and ask them, but of course they did it. were not allowed to talk about piracy while they were on trial, which was for three years. And so um, we had to go to, to uh, Africa. We had to, it was a long journey. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, we made this promise, okay, we will find your real pirates to talk to, you know, so uh, finally we succeeded, we did, and it was a very clandestine situation in the Somalian part of Nairobi in Kenya, where we finally got to talk to seven former Somalian pirates and they were scared, you know, and we, we might be like some, some agency prosecuting them. And then we showed them the videos of the children and they were like, okay, these guys might be crazy, but they are not, <laughs> they are not really dangerous, you know? And, th and then they tried to tell the story really like you would tell it to children and we all understood a lot about the history and background and practice of Somalian piracy. And I will just show you one little piece of it. Oh, these are, this is one of the pirates. There should be sound now. No. Im Spiel ist das ja so, dass es den Leuten, also mir zu, sozusagen Spaß macht, Leute auszurauben und Leute zu töten, ja, Geld zu bekommen, auf einmal so. Und meine Frage ist, ob das in, im echten Pirat, also bei den echten Piraten, also bei euch auch richtig so ist, dass es Spaß macht. Es ist ein schwieriges Leben. Auf der einen Seite hast du das Geld, aber auf der anderen Seite kannst du sowieso den ganzen Tag nicht essen, weil du immer Angst hast. Ja, yeah. so that was the piracy project that in, in terms of the research was very much about what is it really that fuels this mythology of piracy for us in Hamburg? What is there that we want to really protect? What is important, what actually is important about piracy for us? But this was the most interesting part of the project, obviously. And then there can be other projects which are, in terms of the wish triangle, much more initiated by the discourse thing, for example, or by the art discourse, art and discourse tension, which, for example, is this one, where we had a bunch of artists and scholars who were equally interested in, in testing as a practice, as we found that testing, obviously, is a practice that is very important in, in science and is also important in art as we rehearse and we test uh, strategies and so on. And the, uh, so we were interested in, in the notion of the test scenario. And of course, uh, we thought children might be interested too because they get tested so much every day in school and they never test back in a way. So maybe we can interest them in testing back. But then, uh, so we invented this school, this, this project called Children Testing Schools. And in the, in the first research we did about it, we learned that children are actually testing their school a lot. But this, act, this practice of testing is not acknowledged as such. It's mostly seen as provocative behavior, as pushing the boundaries. So how can we frame this, this action that is already going on, this children's action? How can we reframe it to get it acknowledged as testing? And we did this in four different test scenarios. I show you only one, which is the crash testers. I put the audio off for that. So you will see a few examples of the crash testers. The crash testers are basically um, a protocol where children are asked to reuse some equipment of their school for something it wasn't meant to be used for. So you would use, for example, um, 
um, chairs to do it. This was initially, could we do a basketball game with chairs? But, yeah, the basketball game kind of disappeared a little bit. Yeah, anyway, so they kind of reused equipment in their school. And obviously, this is something that is not really popular in a school system. <laughs> so basically, what, what a school environment is about, that you are, you are meant to use stuff one way, right? It's meant to be used one way and not tw two ways. So, um, what, so the children were doing their testing, actually, the testing they do every day, but it was refrained and acknowledged as such. And we, of course, were also testing because it, was very, it brought very interesting results. If children had 10 suggestions for tests like these, how many of them could you actually realize in a day, right? So some would be forbidden, many actually would be forbidden, and some were only possible if, if, if a school uh, people, uh, clerks working at school would help us, would they help us, would they support us? And so out of 10 suggestions, we could, for example, realize in a quite rigid and nervous school, we could realize three. In a kind of flexible and relaxed school, we could realize maybe eight. And so in the end, we actually had a scale to test schools and compare them on a different level then. Um, right, so that was uh, the crash testers. What, what I wanted to, to say about the crash testers is that um, <coughs> what is important for us is that, um, of course, in a heterogeneous uh, research team that includes adults and children and different disciplines and so on, there are very different agendas and interests involved, right? And somehow we need to find a way, we can't get all on the same page. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes we can, but in, in general, it's, it's too much to ask to get us all on the same page. But the better, the better setup for a project like this is that you can have different agendas um, and kind of connect them so that they help each other. Right, so that is what we try to do. And also what is interesting about it maybe to mention is um, the term of the performative role play. So the crash testers obviously is something like a performative role play. It's not a role play like you would have it on stage where, some, where you play a character, fictional character, but still you become crash testers in a way. You are trained, you are explained what a crash tester is. You might get an equipment like, like protecting glasses or stuff. And also um, we ourselves will also be crash testers. So on one level, the performative role play is very important to go into this improbability field and really embody a process and use your action in your body and the process of embodiment as a tool for exploring and for this research. And also, of course, on a certain, in a certain sense, it brings eye-level communication because I might be a crash tester and you are a crash tester, and so it's not so important that I am from academia and you are in third grade. But um, on the other hand, of course, it's, it also shows that for our research projects, we do a lot of preparation. So when we enter into the process with the children, we would already have devised the process very much. So we would not, only in the very beginning of a project, we would go into an open situation, but we would do that to get, come up with how can a process of research be devised. And um, I can give you another example for this. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what I just said. Um, this is another example for performative role play. This is a project that was called the Search for the Miraculous, where we went to go and search for miracles in neighborhoods of Hamburg, mainly. And um, before we, I mean, before we would approach a group of children and asking them if they would help us to search for miracles in their neighborhood, we already had developed, for example, this error, error, or for example, a certain procedure of how miracle searching might take place, you know? So in a way, we always think that it's our responsibility to come up with this performative setup, and then this will open the space for the children to bring their content. I think this relates back to what Darren called form and content. What's wrong? No? Um, Right, so this is, for example, a miracle. 
Yeah, another project uh, um, that makes this very clear, I think, is uh, the spook insurance or maybe ghosts insurance. This is uh, a thing that is going on right now in, in the theater of research at home. Um, schools can, um, <coughs> can get an insurance at the theater against being haunted. So uh, when then a school, uh, there's a, there's a, a school is suspected to be haunted, um, then a team of the theater would go into the school and um, would then start a process to analyze and find the spirits in that school. And this is based on um, research in ethnography about animism and how important the belief in spirits is for certain communal processes in, I don't know, quite remote places from Hamburg. And um, we had this idea that it might be, might be helpful to insert spirits into, a, into school um, to help certain processes of communication and to give children a means to communicate about how they feel in school, how, what kind of atmospheres are in school. So basically it's about the spirit of the place, you know, this concept of the genius Loki. So um, children would make maps of their school where they indicate by color what kind of feeling they associate with certain places. So there might be places where they feel good, there might be places w which are particularly boring, there might be places which are kind of scary. And then we do an analyze of these mappings and um, um, find out uh, places which are interesting in terms of atmosphere. And then we visit these interesting spaces the children um, kind of found by mapping with the machine that is called the, um, uh, how to translate it? Well, it's basically a machine that is meant to give children the chance to get more precise in terms of what the atmosphere is about. So they listen, they make photographs, they describe them, and when they all get on the same page in terms of, okay, the atmosphere is like this, it has this color, it is intense or very slight, then in the end, if they, if they kind of come up with this, then the machine can actually be used to capture the spirit. You will see the captured spirit in a second. So, And then uh, we capture the spirit, and then the children give the spirit a name, give the spirit a story. They tell us how, what kind of conflict made the spirit come into being in the first place, or what kind of, of sometimes it's also a good spirit. So this is now the spirit in the glass. And so then we, we bring these spirits uh, created and named and... and um, we bring them to the theater, and then we invite all the, the public of the school, like the teachers, the other children, and so on. We invite them all to the theater, and we have a kind of seance um, <laughs> where we talk to, uh, where, we, where we tell a little bit the story of speaking to ghosts and, and all the kind of critical stuff around it, and that's probably not true, and we do it anyway. And, and uh, or maybe it's more about what you like the reality to be like. And so um, we have this seance where then children have to decide if they want to bring the spirit back to their school and make it an uh, official member of their school, or if they want to leave it with us. Though we strongly, we strongly um, recommend an inclusive approach to spirit, to also take the maybe also take the little bit ugly ones back with you, because if you just abandon them, they might get come back and be worse. Yes. So what is important about this project is that it is. Um, that it is um, telling, it told us a lot about the relation between process and presentation. That in an explorative or research approach is often a problem. I don't know, I, I talked to many art educators about that. That if you have an explorative approach, it's often so a process that is very, very open. And then at a certain point, you've suddenly realized, oh my God, we have to present in two weeks, right? 
or the exhibition starts into or whatever. And so then suddenly a completely different logic kicks in and all the, all the important, I don't know, the, the, the group dynamics that have been established in this very open exploring process kind of collapse and suddenly it's again about discipline and you have to learn that by heart and please stand in the light and then it's, it's really getting difficult. And so what, what is very important, I think, for our work is that we start with present, presenting, or pr present, yeah, presenting elements from the very beginning. So when we come in a school, for example, we already are in a character of this ghost insurance. And we, we have moments of presentation throughout the whole process that children have to do a show and tell and say, OK, in this class, there's this ghost. This is his name, this is the way it came into being, and so on. So uh, there are lots of moments of presentation during the process, and then the presentation itself is an important part of the process. It's not just presenting results of research, but it's, it's a moment where we all come together and we assess what we did, and we have, to, and we have the chance to, to make collective decisions, like should we take the ghost back to school or not? And so um, I would always um, kind of uh, recommend to, to make pr presentation and process as linked as possible. Right, um, so I told you a lot about wishes and this is maybe, uh, this is a list of wishes we, had, we have worked with in the past. I don't know if it's complete, but there's one wish in this list that we really had. A, there's one wish in this list that was more frequent than all the others. Can you can you maybe which one? Um, yes, that's second, second actually. Rich, yeah, that's the one. I want to be rich is what children wish for. M uh, what most children wish for in Hamburg. And for ages, this wish was kind of annoying, you know, like, oh, come on, not again, because you can work with many of these wishes, like, interestingly. But then this, I want to be rich again, you know, we can't do anything about it. We don't have money ourselves. So, and not in theater, that's for sure. And then um, one day we asked, like, what does it mean to you to be rich? And, and the child answered, ah, to be rich means that we could always pay the electricity bill. And, and then, well, we, uh, of course, we kind of really fast underst quickly understood what this was about. It's about many, it's about poverty experiences. And in, in Hamburg, which is one of the richest cities in Europe, one, of, one out of five children is poor. And in the neighborhoods we mostly work with, it's often much more, like one out of three or one out of two children is poor. So we had to address this wish somehow. And we finally found the Banco Palmas, uh, actually we saw it on TV, something about the Banco Palmas. That's a community bank in Brazil that invented its own currency. I mean, there are many, many projects who, who create local currencies, community currencies. I don't know if you are aware of that. We were not aware of that. We learned it through the Banco Palmas. We went to Brazil and, and learned from the Banco Palmas how to create your own money. So how to build a network where you can actually then print your own money. What do you have to get in place to make your own money? And so also we brought the people from Brazil back to Hamburg as an NGO who helped us to develop. And um, we um, then invented, uh, this is the money of the Banco Pal, oh, sorry, this is the money of the Banco, what is it? Sorry. No. It's not working anymore the way I want to. Right, this is the money of the Banco Palma, sorry. And so uh, what we did was we invented the Children's Bank of Hamburg, which was a network initially made for, uh, made by 50 children, 20 students from university, and then a network of local shop owners, small shops and services in the neighborhood around the theater, finally about 20, and uh, I think in high times 35 shops who took part in this. And um, this is the day where we actually launched the money with a big um, party in the, 
in the neighborhood and in school. And um, yeah, with this money, children can actually buy things in these shops and services in the neighborhood. Uh, not all things, but one thing. So all the shops would would uh, have something on sale for for children's money. Children invented the money. They invented how the currency should look like. They invented the name. So our money is called adventure money. And um, we kind of made the network working, but then children took over and found more and more shops who took part. And um, in these shops, you have always to ask what is on sale for children's money, and then you will get uh, a certain object or maybe even an experience. Like you might also have, um, you might also have, oh shit, sorry. You might also have something like an, a lesson in table tennis or something for it. Um, yeah, and then um, we, we did regularly, we did assemblies in theater where all the people who took, take part in the children's bank come together and we do collective decision making. These, collect, these assemblies are mainly about the question, how much money can we print, right? Because that is the, mo the central question if you do a bank like that. How much money does the network need and what would be too much? Right, and so um, what we learned in this project was that the theater um, is a place that we can use as a forum to call improbable assemblies, like for example the assemblies of the Children's Bank, and that it's a place where we can actually address people very in a very specific way, that we can install assemblies in a way that would make people empowered to speak like experts, of, uh, to, to speak like the authors of their own experience and um, to come up with uh, uh, new forms of, of collective decision making. And also it was a project where we learned about that much of our work is about citizenship actually, to make children a part of the public, to make um, them be citizens and, and really perform their citizen rights and that in empowering them we actually empower ourselves too because we couldn't do, we, we would not have come to the idea to make our own money without them, in a way. Yeah, and so we founded a PhD program that initially was called Assemblies and Participation and now is called Performing Citizenship that we work on together with the university. And in this program you can do, get a PhD by practical, uh, practical experimenting, by experimenting, oh no, that's not right. Let me see, yeah. You can, you can get a PhD by experimenting, uh, doing research in this wish triangle setting, for example, inclusive research, participatory research, uh, using art practices, and um, here are a few impressions of that, maybe. This is the Young Institute of Forecasting. This is children taking part in city planning. Yeah. And um, well, uh, let, me, let me finish maybe by talking a little bit of, uh, about current projects. Uh, one was the one that I just kind of, where is it? Can I bring it back? No, I can't. Of course, we are still doing the children's bank. This is what I wanted to say. We are doing it here in um, Malmö next Saturday, and we do it in Landskrona on Sunday. So this will be a tryout version, like um, a performance that is uh, enabling children to experience what it might be like to make your own money, and also the adults who attend the show, of course, and then we will try it out in a, in a few shops, and maybe we can initiate a children's bank here in Malmö and uh, in uh, Landskrona. Um, apart from that, uh, something that is ongoing is the Society for the Invention of Measuring Devices. Uh, that is um, a p an important part of our work since uh, school clock and time machine is about measurement. Also children testing schools, of course, was about measurement. And then um, 
Darren talked about it too, evaluation is something that is more and more needed or is asked from us. We have to evaluate our work all the time and we wanted to get out of the defensive. We wanted to come up with our own way of measuring our work and not only our work but all kinds of things. And of course children are measured a lot. They are in a regime of being measured from day one, from birth. And uh, so an experience that children don't have and we don't have is, uh, I mean, we, we are measured and we learn how to measure, but we never learn how to inv actually invent measuring methods, right? This is on the, this only uh, scholars and scientists learn this, how to invent measuring devices. We are only confronted with the evidence of them, that they are producing truth, you know, and if we make this experience how to actually invent them, then we will find, or we found, that uh, how actually are they producing truth, right? So this is the Society for the Invention of Measuring Devices that is going on for a while now. And another thing, uh, we came up with a project, uh, we wanted to do something that involves younger children from the age of three. And in, for them, and also for children in primary school, from three to ten, we, we do research about uh, danger. This project is called 50 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Children Do. And it's also for children and for, for their adults, so for educators and parents and so on. As you know, safety is something that is more and more a problem. It's really, really difficult, uh, all these safety regulations you have to deal with when you work with with children and of course that's also a thing that is a conflict between small children and their parents that if you explore the world of course you will you will always always put yourself at risk and parents always and educators always have to say stop don't and so how to change this situation into a more explorative approach like how can we explore danger together right so this is what this project is about um, and uh, it's about instructions to try out dangerous things, like, for example, like a 9-volt battery. And we connect this to, this, to the uh, history of instruction art in life art, um, where, of course, it's a very important part of life art, that, that artists put themselves in danger. This is not an ex example of that. This is a very simple instruction of Yoko Ono we also use in our performance. You can see here, light a match. Um, we explode toys, of course. And this, for example, is a reenactment of a performance of Chris Burden that is about broken glass. And this is the most dangerous thing of all. We try, we, we, we try to be boring. So we wait, how long will it take if we are boring for the children to take over the scene? Uh, this is more a, really a performance piece. Right, this is, uh, you know how imagination runs, how imagination runs wild when it comes to danger, you know? This is really where our society has the real imaginary force is in imagining situations of danger that might occur. So this is from my apartment I have here and rented in Malmö that I, I photographed it yesterday night. So can you imagine a situation like that really happening? <laughs> <laughs> right, and um, I mean, as we in this project for the first time we explored, we really introduced children and very young children into life art. So we told them about Yoko Ono and instruction art and, and, and um, did reenactments of certain pieces which are important to us in the history of, of performance art. And we never did that before. Actually, we kind, of, we kind of hesitated to talk to children about art. Sometimes I think children who worked with us didn't even notice that we, we are kind of artists. They, they thought we are astronauts, you know, and that was what I wanted them to believe, or, or a ghost insurance or stuff. And, and, and also I noticed that it's much easier to do art with children if you don't tell them. I mean, 
um, I don't know how you feel about this, but t telling uh, eight-year-old boys or maybe 11-year-old boys that you are now going to do experimental dancing with them, you can try. <laughs> But um, if, you, if you tell them that you are now experimenting with gravity, which is actually what you are doing in a certain kind of experimental dancing, it will be much better. I can only recommend that. Anyway, <laughs> um, anyway we now actually, uh, with this project, 50 Dangerous Things, we, after 12 years, we started to talk about art to children. And um, we were encouraged to go on doing so by Susan and by the lovely people from a Life Art Development Agency in, in London. And so we will now do a research project that is introducing mixed aged audiences, so including children, to life art. And then ask them, ask the children what they think life art is about. So I'm, I'm very, um, so it's basically, I will show you, it's basically about telling, it's, it's a card game, playing up, which is basically a telling important stories, which are important to us, really, from the history of child art, uh, of life art, and then coming up with an instruction, like for example, this following piece, you come up with an instruction that Children are asked to follow people, r random passers-by around in the city, or stuff like this, you know? And so you can play a game of this. You can, well, this is about performing with animals. Um, you, you can play this game. Oh, that's it. Uh, you can play this game and then uh, afterwards, you w children will have an idea about what, what this practice might have been that they did. And so we will f finally find out about life art. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sibylla, for being so generous with your brilliant practice and methods. Does anybody have any questions for Sibylla? I was interested in the um, uh, time uh, research you were doing, but um, have you only tested it or researched it in Hamburg? Um, or you can say Europe, because I've noticed that there's, this, there's a difference between how people perceive time, where they're, they're uh, well, for example, in Europe or in other, like, or in Asia. I'm I mean, sure that is, I'm sure yeah. that is. Actually, this project, School Clock and Time Machine, we did it in different, also different cities of Germany, because of course also you always have with, I mean, I'm very happy that we all meet here, but basically um, it's very difficult in, in working with children, you always have the language gap, right? So I can't work with children in, in places where they don't speak German or English really, not really well. So I need to train people there to do that then. But apart from that, school clock and time machine we made in a time when there were many schools in Germany who still had the 45 minutes rhythm, like bell going, I don't know how it is here, but it was very much the moment where schools actually changed that or wanted to change that. So it was also a project of the early uh, 2000 years to help schools to think about time differently and I think we wouldn't do the project like that again because now it changed a lot already in school. Does anybody else have a question? Um, I'm interested in the project you did about uh, 50 dangerous things to mm -hmm. let your kids do. Um, the concept of, of the boredom being the most dangerous thing that you found, or uh, exposing kids to boredom, I guess, was what you were trying to show. Could you uh, maybe talk about uh, some of the response you got from kids or what kind of insight that you got from, s from that experience? Yeah, I mean, what I should say probably is as we wanted to do something for, three year for, for an audience of three-year-olds and older, Different to most of our projects, this is very short term. So we basically do this together for, for an hour, right? So it's a very performance-like piece. 
which is very interactive. So children, we sometimes all the audience members do something together. Sometimes children come on stage and try something out and so on. But basically, it's a performance. And in a children's performance, I mean, if you we we are also a quite traditional venue for children's theatre that happens a lot in our theatre in our venue. And what is, I mean, other than in, in adults' experimental theatre where you can do things which are really, really boring and t audience still sits there and kind of takes it in. <laughs> you, in a chil in a chi with a children audience, you would, if you will lose them immediately and they will, and you will not be able to get them again and it will be embarrassing. And this is what, what performers in children's theatre fear most. So it's basically what, what was mo most dangerous for us. But what the children then, I mean, in most performances, children just waited through it. They kind of didn't went, but they didn't go for it. But there was one performance where they were like, like this at the machinery and kind of really in danger too. They, there is this wheel and they were running in the wheel. <laughs> and then we were like, oh my God. But there were only one. We need to wrap up now, but Sibylla will be in the panel discussion later today, so you'll have more of a chance to hear about her practice and ask questions then. Because we've had such two incredibly rich presentations this morning, we're now going to have a probe from the Mission Project before lunch. Thank you, Sibylla. Thank you.